thank you very much for coming to our meeting of the uh, Board of Trustees for the 14th of April, and our meeting will now begin at 7.16. So I'm also, uh, so I'm gaveling in our regular meeting of the Board of Trustees and also the special meeting of the Board of Trustees, which will also begin at 716. There's two agendas there, and the uh, special meeting was to cover some information that we got um, rather um, uh, late, which required us to um, make it as a special meeting so that we could install our short-term assignments um, of non-academic short-term employees. So hopefully everyone has those two agendas. So the first, um, we've called our meeting to order. And the first thing on our regular agenda is the uh, report of action taken in closed session. Do we have a report out? No, okay, we actually, we had no action taken in closed session. Uh, approval of the agenda. It's been moved by Trustee Riley, second by Trustee Galassa to approve the agenda. Are all in favor? Any opposed? Any abstain? And I should mention that we do have a quorum here. The next item is the approval of the minutes. Uh, trust, so it's been moved and second for discussion. Has it, did we have a second? Okay, uh, Trustee Gonzalez here. On the uh, prior item, uh, the agenda, I actually wanted to pull for discussion uh, two items. Item, excuse me, 42 and item 43 for discussion. So if we could move those off the consent calendar and just put them on in discussion. Can we, um, Madam Clerk, do, um, item number 42, consider approval of resolution number 141538 to purchase and install kitchen equipment in the nutrition department in the Barbara Lee Merritt College Science and Allied Health Building and 43. Consider approval of resolution 141536 to enter into an agreement with Spoceto Engineering to complete all site paving improvement project at the Barbara Lee Science and Allied Health Center at Merritt College. And Madam Chair, I would also like to pull, just to add some names. Sorry, I'd like to pull item 32, uh, merely to add uh, two names to, merely to add two names to the list. And uh, <clears throat> that's consider board vote for the Community College uh, Trustees Board elections. Thank you. So the next, so we were on the approval of the minutes. So do we need to re-vote on the agenda technically because we pulled those? No, we, we did actually do the approval of the agenda and we were on the minutes. So we need a motion and a second regarding the approval of the agenda with the um, amendments as noted on the board. There. Uh, move approval of the amended agenda. It's been moved and seconded by Trustee gonzalez Humana and Trustee Riley. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? Thank motion you. carries. So, to the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, moved. Moved and seconded by Trustee gonzalez Humana and Trustee Riley. Any, all, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. So the next item on the agenda is the public comment. Do we have any public communication? Uh, Madam President, we have, oh, I don't know, it looks like about eight public comments, something along those lines. And uh, it's just sort of an awkward way of doing this, but I guess we're going to do it this way. Um, uh, Marquita Price and then Ajari McCaster and Kendra, looks like Callway, and Chris Russell, you're the first four if you'd step forward. It's for public comment. Marquita Price. How's everybody doing this evening? My name is Ajari McCaster, and I'm running for Senate at uh, Merritt, Merritt College for the ASMC. And the reason I'm, run and, uh, the reason I'm running is to uh, 
create awareness of the resources and services available at Mary College. Um, when I first got to the college, I struggled with finding the resources and services and tools that I needed to succeed when, um, when I was there. And they're put in place, they're put there in place for us to succeed, but I had trouble getting a hold of who I needed to to do what I needed to do. Um, so I proposed that as like as running for senator, I should be able to get these resources and bring them to the classroom for students to be able to utilize everything like and maximize utility and be able to take full advantage of whatever Merritt College has to offer. Also, I would like to make a proposition. Um, we have martial arts demonstrations and, and such things at this school, but um, it would be better if we could have martial arts classes or dance classes since they have those at Laney, but we don't get them at Merritt College. And also, like maybe music studios for people to be able to have a creative outlet and a radio station. A radio station would be very, very much appreciated at Merritt College for those who aspire to be you know, radios or whatever the case may be. But there's a lot of things at the college that we're lacking that we plan to that we plan to change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McCaster. Um, Marquita Price and then Kendra Callway. Is Marquita Price here? Oh, great. Uh, good evening, my name is Marquita Price. Um, I go to Mary College. I'm also um, a candidate of the SMC elections. I'm running for student body president. And I'm also, I'm actually here to kind of follow up on some issues that we had discussed in December, December 9th board meeting um, regarding SMC funds and the, um, the seeds or removal of all the funds. From my knowledge, I talked to Daddy Del Rosario, our um, business manager, and she notified us that the student funds are still at merit, although everything else has moved, so that's good to hear, but we kind of understand still. The students have been verbally told things as, as such that we will be liable if we decide to further keep our funds here and not comply to district's um, decision to put everything on one system in one accordance. So, but again, it's just been verbal. We haven't given gotten any guidance or whatnot. We're, we're students with a full load. so. We are doing what we can on our own, and again, um, I have forged, um, I emailed you all late, all you board members late, um, a copy of this timeline of us trying to reach board members, district meetings, I mean district um, members, uh, merit members, um, um, administration. Um, I've talked to the president; she's um, tried to communicate as well. But we again, it hasn't been enough transparency. Susan Wren, vice chancellor of finance. We've been getting kind of the runaround and getting sent back to the same people. So I'm here today um, first to kind of follow up on that because it's not um, transparent to the student body what exactly the plan, like Peralta's plan, is to do um, about that issue. So again, we'll, we'll like to have that meeting that we, were, we discussed with Susan Wren January 26th at the first SMC meeting of this semester. So. We're still waiting on that meeting to talk about things. Students still want to be included again. That's why I'm running for student body president. Um, so uh, enough about the fund, fund 71. Um, I'm running for student body president at Mary College because as I see, it's a lot of stuff that's going on that the students are not being um, completely involved in. And so my, my, one of my goals is to, to uphold the legacy of the, um, the Black Panthers. Mary College is home in the Panthers, and so they did everything they could politically and academically to make sure the students was heard, all students. Um, and so, yeah, that's my big goal at Merritt as well, to make the student life like my um, comrade Ajari McCaster said, was want to up, up the student life as, as well as make more people want to transfer from Merritt, because Merritt is kind of like a home school. We're on that hill, so we have family up there. So we want to be more involved. The students want to be more involved, but they sometimes you got to give them a little shove to get them um, relax from their books. So again, thank you. My name is Marquita Price. I'm running for student body president at Merritt College. And I, I would really like to get information regarding Fund 71 and you guys' decision on how we're going to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Price. Uh, Kendra Colway. She's going to pass her time. Everyone okay. else Chris continue. Russell. He passes time. Venus Morris. Okay, uh, Marios Cluis. 
and Herb Kitchen. <laughs> okay. Well, you got you got an extra half an hour here. Good evening, President Brown, Board of Trustees, Chancellor, Vice Chancellors, College Presidents, and members of the community. <clears throat> Each of you have a packet in front of you with information that has been sent to, um, to each of you, and it chronicles what Pa has been saying for the past two years about Peralta's achievement gap. And I'm not going to read our entire letter because I only have two minutes and 30 seconds, but um, I'm going to just highlight some issues that Pa has regarding um, Peralta's achievement gap. Proud Association of African American Affairs continues to be extremely concerned about the achievement gap here at Peralta for students of color and the lack of implementation and or strategic programs across the district. Over the past three years, our organization has met and worked with Chancellor Ortiz to draw attention to this problem of Peralta's African American achievement gap. In spring 2014, there was a commitment to implement an appropriate program for fall 2014, yet it is April and still no concrete deliverables are in sight. A close examination of the 2014 state-generated student success scorecard and Peralta's data underscores the fact that the achievement gap for African-American students remains here at Peralta. Across the country, similar achievement gaps are being addressed. Even President Obama sees the need for initiating a program named My Brother's Keeper. However, the means in which dedicated resources such as past dollars combined with equity plan dollars are being disproportionately retained for usage at the district level, which suggests that black students don't matter. The Proud Association of African American Affairs is calling on this board of trustees to treat the achievement gap of African American students as a policy priority policy and fiscal matter. Specifically, we request the following. One, that the Board of Trustees leadership and guidance to ensure that a program to address the achievement gap of Peralta's students of color be a priority with the district and implemented in a timely fashion. Two, the Board of Trustees we are requesting that the Board of Trustees request Chancellor Ortiz, as well as the next interim and or permanent chancellor, to prepare and publicly present a data-driven monthly report that clearly identifies the impact of campus and district-based programs and resources that are being used to close the African-American achievement gap. Thirdly, that the progress toward closing this achievement gap, or lack thereof, be an evaluation standard that assess and hold accountable the chancellor and campus presidents. Peralta's African American achievement gap can no longer be viewed as a PA issue. It is a district issue. Your actions to aggressively address this neglect and to improve Peralta's achievement rates will improve better outcomes and opportunities for African American students attending the Peralta Community College District, now and into the future. Thousands of Peralta students, community members, and staff await a report from you addressing our concerns at your May 12th board meeting. Respectfully submitted, Herbert Kitchen President, Ann Childress, Vice President of the District Office, Tony Cook, Vice President at College of Alameda, Eileen Young, Vice President at Berkeley City College, Dr. Angela Cherry, Vice President, Laney College, Carlos McLean, Vice President of Merritt College, and the entire membership of the Peralta Association of African American Affairs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kitchen. We have no further public comment. May I ask our student, uh, the Marquita Price, could those documents that you have, Ms. Price, could you give those to the board clerk so that the uh, trustees could see them, if you don't mind? I don't, I'm not, we didn't, we didn't get them. So we want to make sure we have a chance to get them if you have a copy for the board clerk. Thank you. Oh, oh your, your documents, please. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind, if you could give those to the board clerk so she could distribute them to the, the board. Thank you. Oh, and to the, college, well, to the college presidents also. We'll make sure they get them too. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, Madam President, there is one additional public comment uh, speaker, and that is Lewis Young. Uh, good evening to the board and the uh, chancellor. Uh, I'm here uh, because I was kind of embarrassed when I came back to work. Um, the uh, chair in my department told me that I was fired. And uh, immediately I said, you can't fire me because you didn't hire me. Now, uh, these things have gone on periodically over the years. Not anybody telling me that I was fired, however, but uh, the uh, way the schedules are made out in that department. The schedules are made out by the chair the chairs, rather, and the dean. However, for, the, for a number of years, uh, I'd say the past five or six years, there's a sect there gets together, vote for one person, the person, the chairs that they vote for, or we have a chair and a co-chair, the chairs give them the prime assignment, and they never move from their assignment. Now, I've been here 29 years. It's a long time. Um, and it's sickening to go to a meeting and uh, see the teachers who are involved in this practice get together, sit together, eat together, whatever they do. And uh, at the end of the day, when a decision is made, it's made with them being the voters for it because they have gotten together before uh, this or the incident has come up or whatever comes up. Now, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I was off last year because I was ill. And uh, the illness came from the stress that I've received here since I've been here the last 12 years or so. Uh, I, I was not, I'm not angry because I was not hired, but I was more qualified than the people uh, hired at the time. So uh, I really wish that there would be some way that I know you have an investigative uh, process here and uh, when they go through this process, everything comes out. I get the same type letter that I got in the beginning. Please wrap up. Huh? Uh, just please wrap up your comments. Oh, oh, oh please wrap up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's kind of tough for to wrap 29 years up in three minutes, but I'm through. Thank you very much. No more com public comments. Thank you very much, Trustee gonzalez -Yun. The next <coughs> item on our agenda are the uh, Associated Student Government Reports. Hello, everybody. My name is Malik Banks, I, I, and I'm a senator for community building at Berkeley City College uh, with the Associated Students of Berkeley City College. Um, Quick brief history of me, I'm new here. Um, I'm from Sacramento. I moved here about three years ago and started my education at Berkeley City College. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and continue with my report. Um, kind of start my report off, I'm going to start with elections. Um, 
I was a member of the elections committee. Um, I've noticed that uh, elections are going really well. We have a lot of student involvement with casting their votes, and we already have about, about 250 plus votes as of 3 p.m. today. Um, kind of going, kind of reflecting on um, some of the things that have happened in the last couple weeks. Um, we had a really successful health event last week on April 9th. Um, uh, it was an event where um, various resources, health resources um, in the Berkeley area were to come um, table in our atrium. Um, also, we had a very inspiring Queer Spectrum open mic night last Friday. And some things to be looking forward to from the Associated Students of Berkeley City College. Um, our Mental Health Awareness Week is coming up on uh, May 4th. Um, it's uh, all this, most of the senators and some of the uh, executive board members on the ASPCC are working very hard to bring this event to the students. Also, uh, Student Success Day. We have members of the um, Associated Students Transfer Service Community and also um, Campus Life working on this event. And that will be coming to you on um, this Friday. Um, we are also working on a plant initiative um, to the district. Um, be, um, you will receive a contract um, to complete this process. But uh, one of our senators has, uh, has worked very hard on um, making a contract for um, putting plants in our building to make a more lively campus. Um, also, um, two students and Mustafa have received um, a uh, $10,000 uh, fellowship for the Dalai Lama Foundation. Um, this will open a center to provide uh, to, to provide uh, like a, a safe place for undocumented students and their families. Um, and that's about it. That concludes my report. Thank you. Do we have any other associate student government reports? Good evening. My name is Adrian Abouyan. I'm from College of Alameda. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Associate Students. Uh, good evening, President Brown, the Board of Trustees, our College President, um, all of our College Presidents. Uh, Dr. Ortiz and our uh, Vice Chancellors. Uh, since I've come to you last, my report will be shorter this time since I've now been here semi-often. <laughs> um, so recently uh, in our student center, um, recapping, uh, we have video games now available for students to play. Uh, we thought this was a great decision. Um, students have been asking a place where they can congregate and uh, hang out. And we keep directing them to our, our, our pit. So we've uh, decided to lively up, uh, liven up our uh, cafeteria upstairs, so we had some video games, uh, Xbox and Wii, and there's been some friendly competition through that. Um, recently, we had a Cesar Travis uh, event that took place um, in honor of him and the work brought about by the movement uh, down in Central California. Uh, we also had uh, traditional Aztec dancers come in who um, uh, honor their ancestors through traditional dance, um, and also screening of the Cesar Travis movie. Um, another thing we've done is uh, we had a couple of our students went out to uh, Civic Corps out here in Oakland. They did a leadership retreat uh, for students who attend the uh, Civic Corps. Um, on March 17th, uh, the ASCOA also helped and volunteered uh, to lead tours on our campus uh, for the CTE uh, fair we had, um, which hosted from local, we hosted local high school students, about 500 of them on our campus, and they got to see things like our admin department and our dental assisting and so forth. Um, Another one is um, to conclude our celebration of Women's Her Story Month. I think last time I mentioned it to you guys, uh, we had an event where students came out and made art pieces to honor the courage, commitment, uh, and character of women. Uh, we're also putting together, um, hopefully, an exhibit where we can display those pieces of art. Um, as part of our lecture series on breaking barriers, uh, on April 8th, we had Dr. Jeff uh, Duncan Andrade come to speak to our students. Uh, that was a packed event. We really enjoyed that. Uh, we had food available for them. Um, he spoke about um, growing uh, roses in concrete and the damaged um, petals we made bare, uh, but we still pursue education anyway. Um, on April 17th, uh, the ICC and the ASCOA are taking a trip to UC Santa Cruz to have a college tour there. Uh, looking forward to that. On April 25th, we are hosting a uh, faculty versus student softball game. Um, our advisor here, Dr. Escobar, and the faculty beat us last year, so hopefully this semester we won't be so embarrassed and lose, and so we're hosting another one. A great turnout for that. We love how students have to take part in that. 
Uh, later in April, we'll be hosting events on Asian Pacific American heritage um, for traditions and history of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States. Uh, in addition to our Breaking Barriers series, um, we on May 13th, we have Cesar Cruz coming to speak to our students also in our student center. Uh, on May 15th, uh, the ASUE is hosting our annual award ceremony uh, to honor the achievements of clubs, sports teams, and our scholarship winners, um, which are board trustees. You will ho hopefully be receiving our invitation soon, and I hope to see you, many of you there. Um, and lastly, uh, on March 21st, this is recapping, I like to save my best for last, um, the ASUE had the privilege of attending the Barbara Lee and L. Hugh Harris Nonviolence Lecture Series at Fame Church in Oakland. Uh, Trustee Handy was also there. She can share with a little bit more about that with you. Um, but it was titled, I really like this, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? And in that room, we had the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center come and had students manning the event. They, they seated us, and they also provided um, uh, speeches there, which just, just blew you away. One of them said, this room is full of people um, who have done great things are for civil rights, and all of them are older now. And he's, he, but he, he rebounced and said that, but they are pillars of a community, and we can learn a lot from them. Um, he shared wisdom there that I will never forget. These kids are from, range from ages 11 to 17, and they blew me out of the water. You think student government can do something, but these students, I'm telling you, when I have kids one day, I hope they attend this place. I do. And that concludes my report. Thank you so much. Good evening, Chancellor, Board of Trustees, President, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Adrian Jackson. I am an ASMC Senator from Merritt College. Uh, some of the items that we performed or we did this year or this month, uh, on 4-8, we had a Cesar Chavez event also. And we had a keynote speaker, Don Juan Carlos Aruz, who had an interactive presentation and discussion regarding equity. Uh, on the same day, we had the Office of Student Activities and Campus Life sponsored a community healing where over 20, 20 community agencies uh, and employers provided resources and jobs for the students that were there. And because it was such a needed item, it was uh, requested that we do it again. So we will have another event on 428 uh, because the students really uh, were interested and wanted it again. Uh, on 4-8 also, the Ability Counts Club uh, also provided bags of food to uh, students. On 4-14, uh, we had our campaign debate, which is today, and the students were saying why they were interested in becoming uh, senators and being on the ASMC. Uh, today also, we had uh, Kevin Powell, who spoke regarding equity with, with students, staff, faculty, and administration. And uh, the overall that we understand uh, from it is that we need to work together as a team. Um, that goes for presidents and for faculty, counselors, and students, because the students really need the help. And so we really need to make sure that uh, they are being provided with avenues of taking care of needs so we don't lose as many students as we've been losing. Uh, on 421, the Anthropology Club will be celebrating our first Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Celebration. And it's from 1230 to 1.30 at the quad, D quad. And we will have Polynesian and Asian dancers. So if you're free, please come out. Uh, on 422, the Chemistry Club is having a Jeopardy Jam to prepare for uh, the midterms. On 427, the Tobacconist Club Awareness and Art Contest will be judged to become a smoke-free campus. And then on 428, ASMC will be sponsoring the Native American Indigenous Celebration. The community will be honoring Native American students in Peralta District. The following, following agencies will be in attendance. The Native American Health Center, the Intertribal Friendship House, the Washoe Native TANF, American in Indian Resource Center, the United Indians Nation, we will also have indigenous people from Ecuador, El Salvador, and Mexico. We will have an educational presentation by Suwami. I think I said his name right, Suwam Dance. And join us with the native song, drummers, dancers, and honoring our students. Indian tacos with infused water will be served. So thank you, and that concludes my presentation. The date again? The date again? 
The date will be uh, April 28th. So please come out and join us. All right, thank you. The next item on our agenda is the uh, Chancellor's Report. Thank you very much, President Brown, and good evening. Actually, with the uh, celebration of Cesar Chavez Day, which, by the way, the Peralta District is one of the very few in the country recognizing the work of Cesar Chavez, who has an incredible impact on social justice, not only for the uh, farm workers in the state of California, but through the civil rights movement throughout this country. Uh, and we also had a spring break, which meant um, many of our institutions, our four colleges were ghost towns for about a week. Um, but since then, we're back and we're rocking and rolling. Uh, and that's the end of my report. Thank you very much, Chancellor Ortiz. The, now we have the Board of Trustees reports, and we'll start with Trustee Galassa. Trustee Gonzalez Yen. Thank you very much, President Brown. Um, I'll make this relatively brief. I just <clears throat> uh, this past week attended the National Conference for the Asian Pacific Americans in Higher Education uh, in San Francisco, and I was pleased at how well Peralta was represented on numerous panels uh, with many students in attendance, faculty, administrators, uh, and staff. And I myself pre uh, prepared a, a two-part workshop uh, highlighting the value of community college students, or the value of community colleges to students and uh, the importance of sharing narrative uh, in that way. Uh, it was a, overall a wonderful experience, and I'm happy to report that next year, Apahi will be coming to Oakland, California uh, for its national conference. That's all. Trustee Handy. Um, I too had the opportunity to attend Apahi, and I was really proud to see um, the faculty and staff members from our colleges there, especially Tomoko, and um, also the amount of students that came over, and I had an opportunity to speak with them. I did get to see the film made by the Laney College students about their experiences, and I had an opportunity to sit in on a, on a PC, um, plenary session. And, and, and what struck me about it is that we have so many stories, so many stories. And people have always wondered why I took students to the Congressional Black Caucus. Well, it's for the same reason that what you see on the students' faces when you went to go to the Apahi Conference and you see the films that have been made about the students' experiences. They bring so much with them. And without an opportunity like that, you may not ever hear their stories, and I think it's just um, wonderful that Apahi has grown, outgrown San Francisco, will be in Oakland next year, and I'm hoping that um, Peralta will be able to be more involved in the filming of it, because the types of um, presentations that are given, and our own Cecilia Cervantes, from um, past president of College of Alameda, was there as well. But um, the types of presentations that, that are there, and the people who have come out of the woodwork and all over the world to give their presentations are things that all of us would enjoy seeing. And so I'm hoping that next year, I think we had 20 or 40 students coming over. Close to 50. I heard that they took up the whole BART car and they were so excited to be there. And I'm hoping, and I'm sure that our students will have a more active in, um, involvement next year. So congratulations to the staff and um, the group who put together the Apahi Conference. And thank you for allowing us to be there. I have a uh, Trustee Oliver. I uh, wasn't going to come today, but because I'm kind of, you know, tired of, um, you know, I've been speaking about a lot of issues uh, since I've been in this role, and um, I felt like, you know, I, I, I felt that uh, the issues I've raised have not um, been respected, but, um, so I wasn't going to come, but I was at P.F. Chang's, and I opened up a fortune cookie, and I have it right here, it's pretty funny, it said, you will make a change for the better, try politics crazy so I came I'm here um, you know um, 
I attended a conference today, uh, or not a conference, um, a speaker at uh, Mary College, Kevin Powell is a great speaker, uh, facilitated some great discussion among students um, about equality in education and what education means to them. Um, and after that, there was a meeting, he facilitated a discussion with the leadership on campus, which included students and uh, administrators, faculty and staff in the room. Um, and one of the faculty members brought up that she has a problem uh, getting students to come meet with her about, um, you know, just about, you know, about their classes and getting them support. And, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people in the room brought up that, you know, people have problems out in their lives outside of the classroom and, and that students need wraparound services. Um, so I'd like to share with you guys what I kind of said in the room was, um, you know, to have wraparound services, you know, the college and, and, and people need to be connected. And I don't feel that, um, you know, everyone's connected. There's a lot of uh, competition going on. You have people like in different areas, like this is my area. You know, if you want to use this, you need to ask me. Or if you want to make a decision over here, you, want, you need anything over here, you need to ask me. Or, you know, you have 25 faculty members, 25 new positions opening up, and you have counselors competing with instructors and who's going to get what and, you know, what campus is going to get what. And, you know, as students, we, you guys are in competition and you guys aren't connected. Uh, you guys brought Darla Cooper here about a year ago, and she brought up the six student success factors. One of them is connected. So how can we be connected to the campus um, to be successful if the college itself and district are not connected to each other. So, um, yeah. Um, so I'd just like to share that with you guys. Um, also, um, I got an email maybe a week ago uh, from James Blake. James Blake resigned. Wow. Um, you know, I talked about two board meetings ago about me resigning, and man, you know, uh, it's, it's struggle is real. <laughs> When uh, you're you're a big advocate, you feel strongly for what you believe in, and um, you know you're just not able to make the change that you that you would like. Um, some about James, man, James is a great advocate for students. You know he's a he was a classified Senate president uh, for the district and Laney College, and he didn't advocate for classified. He advocated for students. He knew he who he worked for. I just I, yeah. So uh, yeah, James Blake kind of knew who he worked for. Um, you know, he's a great advocate for students, and um, <laughs> yeah, I just he always came up and spoke the real. And you guys, I, not you guys, not everyone. I can't say everyone, but as a majority, you know, the people who could make a difference, I don't think they actually listened to him. And my first or second board meeting, you guys had a consultant come up and tell you guys problems about your plans and things like that, and. You know, I was I was looking at the slides and I said to myself that James Blake has been saying these things for years, and you paid somebody ninety thousand to tell you the same thing the people that actually work for you has been telling you. So, you know, maybe you guys should just kind of like you know, in the future maybe listen and respect the leadership that is in place. Um, I, I, and I see myself as a student leader. I see James Blake as a classified center leader, and. Um, you know, we're all supposed to be working towards one goal, so I don't feel that, um, you know, hope you guys are pr <laughs> proud that he resigned. Some people are definitely happy because you don't want to hear his mouth. You know what I mean? I, I understand that because uh, I guarantee some people don't want to hear my mouth sometimes, but I'm still trying. Um, um, another thing is, so I was watching, so... <clears throat> A student came up earlier saying they want to change things at the college. Um, I've been speaking to you guys about shared governance, and you know the students don't even know that they can come to share that they have rights to be at a, a part of the governance on campus. They want to bring resources to the campus, and they want to be a, be a part of the leadership and the and the change so bad. And you guys won't set up. You won't make it easy for us. You know they don't know that what committee to go to to bring the resources. They have ideas and what they, they know what they want at their campus, but how are we trained to come to a shared governance meeting? What shared governance meeting do we go to? Uh, who do we talk to? We're not really connected, so um, it would be nice if, if over the next year, before the, the fall two, uh, 2015 semester begins, that you guys 
give some leadership development and, and share governance for not just students, but faculty and classified too. They, they need the same thing. Um, so, um, um, what else did I want to say? Um, so I wasn't here at the last board meeting, but I did, I did watch it a little bit. And I saw during public comment that um, a speaker came and it was Matt Goldstein. Not to throw you out there, but um, hello. So, um, you know, he came and brought up that in the Chancellor Selection Committee that he didn't feel that faculty was represented, that he felt like the majority of, you know, that faculty is a, you know, is a majority representative and that faculty should have, should be increased membership. That lets me know when you guys think about leadership and governance in the district, you don't think about students because if you did, students are the majority. It's about 24,000 students in the district, and there's 1,000, about 1,000 faculty. So if we're asking for proportional membership, yeah, I can wrap up. Um, if you're asking for proportional membership, then yeah, students want proportional membership. We want to feel involved. Uh, thank you. So uh, I actually had an opportunity to attend the Afahi conference as well. Um, it was a wonderful conference. I was able to participate in, or I should say attend one of the sessions where um, administrators, college presidents, senior staff were present. And it was great to hear these people who had been through a leadership training program talk about their experiences and the support they got through uh, the leadership development program in Afahi. And um, also, the, uh, there was a very dynamic speaker that spoke about uh, Title IX and um, the equity that uh, we need to uh, support on campus uh, with, with our, our efforts in our community so that people feel safe and feel included and are respected and have free access to education. So it was a very wonderful conference. There, Peralta was very well represented. It reminded me of what talent we have at Peralta. And, you know, some people say people move through Peralta, but when you, there's so much talent that's here, these people need to be able to go and be stars and take leadership roles, and they find those all over the state of California and all over the nation. So it, we were very proud to see people who had been through Peralta and gone to take leadership roles um, on a national scale. And um, I should also say I was very proud to be a sponsor of the Apahi um, Conference through uh, my law firm. And it's great to be able to be a part of, uh, of the business community that can actually support uh, diversity in uh, leadership in uh, community colleges. So the next, uh, that concludes my, uh, oh, we have Trustee Raleigh. Would you like to give a trustee report? So the, the next item on our agenda is the District Academic Senate Report. Do we have someone to give that for Dr. Van Putten? So the next item then is the uh, presentations, and we have a budget workshop presentation from Vice Chancellor, Interim Vice Chancellor Susan Rennie. Uh -oh, that's I'm humming. <laughs> In front of you, um, everyone should have a packet that um, has the pa uh, a presentation slides and then some backup documentation. The purpose of this workshop today is um, we're going to go over the history of Peralta Community College's budget over the last few years. Then we're just going to do like a fundamental review of the revenues and the expenditures um, and what makes up those revenues and expenditures and kind of go over the fund balance and how it's um, worked over the last few years, and then go into the 2014-15 budget and where we actually are right now, and then 15-16 and what the outlook is for that, and some multi-year projections. So if you want to go ahead and turn to the second page of this document right here, the presentation. Many of you were here back in 2009-10 um, when the board adopted the budget on April 10th, 2010. 
And that budget, if you recall, was based on actually the expenditures to date. We had, um, it was mid-year, and we had someone go through and look at expenses to date and project out from those expenses what we needed in order to fund that budget for that year. That budget at that time was also the first year that the state implemented the workload reductions for the state of California on the community colleges. We as a district lost about 727 full-time equivalent students at that, at that cut. Any of the positions that were not filled that year were basically lost in the transition because it was not a budget that was built on positions, it was built on dollars that were spent to date. So if you were not in that position and you were not um, being charged, then you would not have been included in the, in the budget that year. The next year was 2010-11 and we actually did have a budget that was on time and we started to, the state allowed us to restore some of the um, workload reductions from the prior year. We were able to restore almost 614, so it was about 619.13.9. That budget was basically a rollover budget from the previous year, so whatever was budgeted uh, in 2009-10 became part of the 10-11 budget, and there was no restoration of positions in that fiscal year. Then the next fiscal year, we had another on-time budget, but it also was the second year of the workload reductions. At this workload reduction, it was much more dynamic, and we, we were um, forced with about 1,480 full-time equivalent students that we were reduced by. Um, we also, that year, seeing that coming, had um, offered an uh, early retirement on June 30, 2011. We had 45... Um, employees actually take that workload reduction. 21 of them were faculty positions and 24 were classified or, and or administrators. The positions, the faculty positions at that time were agreed that they would be filled with part-time faculty um, and that would allow us some cost savings to help ease the reductions that we were facing. And then the, the other positions such as librarians and classified staff would be on a case-by-case -case basis. That year we also required all of the discretionary budgets throughout the, the college to do a 15% reduction and that included the district office and all, all campuses. So then the next fiscal year, as you'll notice we had another on-time budget, we're getting better. Um, this was the first year that the, the state actually allowed us to do, uh, to start restoring our FTSs. We restored 192 FTS as the first year that we, of 12-13. Um, that was also the year, if you recall, that Prop 30, we were faced with the Prop 30. We had um, planned, the budget was planned to lose about $15 million because we were uncertain if Prop 30 would pass or not. So when we adopted the budget, it was less the Prop 30 dollars. So our fall semester that year was very, um, was a re, uh, reduced section, was reduced in sections. But Prop 30 and Measure B both passed, so our spring schedule we were able to enhance and re reload some of our um, sessions. And we were also able to restore the 15% to the colleges of the, what um, discretionary budgets had been reduced. But we did not restore that 15% to the operating or the discretionary budgets at the, at the campus. That year there were no positions restored, but we did create new positions. Um, I believe we created 20 positions that year. Then last year we had another on-time budget and we had something that we weren't used to. We had a cost of living adjustment from the state, although little, it was 1.57%, it was something. Um, from that we, we developed um, and we gave 3% salary increases for all employees and we gave a 1% one-time bonus that year. This fiscal year, 2014, we also had an on-time budget and this is the last year that we're going to be able to actually restore any of the FTSs that were um, what, that were imposed on, by, on us by the workload re reductions by the state. So in your packet, there is a um, a spreadsheet that kind of it, it's, it's called full history of full-time equivalent students, and that shows you when they were taken and when we were able to restore them, and a history of our FTSs. And if you'll notice on there. Our FTSs, um, our high point was 19,499,000 in 2008-9. This year we are slowly creeping back up to that. We're budgeting and we're expecting, we were, we're borrowing FTSs, but we're going to um, report a 19,500. 
so you can see down below the years in 9, 10, and 11, 12 where we actually lost. We've lost over 2,000 2, FTSs and we've been able to restore them as of this year. We will be able to have restored them. So that's basically, in a nutshell, the history of our FTSs, the restoration, um, how we passed a budget, and just kind of to get us all on the same page. And then the next part that I kind of wanted to go over was the different revenue streams that we receive and the different expenditure um, streams or way we spend our money. And um, on the general fund, and this is general fund revenues, and on the general fund revenues, 80% um, of our revenues are what we call computational revenues. And the computational revenue is basically how many students we have times a factor or times a state allocation factor. And the funding source for this is made up of local property taxes, student enrollment fees, EPA dollars as of 12-13, and state funds. So basically what um, the state does is it takes the number of full-time equivalent students that we report and it multiplies it by a factor giving us a dollar amount that they, fig that they owe us. Then they use these other factors to determine how much is actually coming out of their coffers. The other revenues will make up about 4% and those are just mainly ma um, mandated costs and lottery dollars. And then local revenues about 10% and our transfers in, which is basically the reimbursement from our trust for the um, OPEB, the retiree benefits that we pay out from the general fund, makes up about 8%. And then lastly, our general fund expenditures. As um, we are a people business, our salaries and benefits make up about 80% of our total expenditures. And one of the questions that we've, that has, um, been brought up is how do we actually budget for our our part-time faculty and so I wanted to go over so that all of us were on the same page with that um, our full-time faculty when we we start with our full-time equivalent students excuse me can you just remind us where you are what what paper am I looking at right now oh I'm sorry I'm in the just in the thank you and what page is that we're on page five thank you very much sorry And so for the, for, for the full-time faculty, what we actually do is we, um, we take the number of our target for our full-time equivalent students and take that number and then we say um, a productivity level of 17.5. So we determine how many students, I mean, how many faculty are we gonna need in order to actually educate that number of students. Once we have that number, we look at our full-time positions for faculty and take that, multiply it by two, because they teach two semesters, and we subtract that from our, our number. And, and um, for next year, our total faculty that we are going, to, that we're anticipating that we're going to need is 1,270, with about, um, our release time for department chairs is 15, so it's about 1,285 faculty that we'll need next year. Of that, we have positions of 290, um, which we'll teach two semesters, so that would be 580. So we're going to have to fill 705, almost 706 part-time faculty, um, or full-time equivalents with part-time faculty for next year. And when we multiply that out by our average of $44,000 per faculty member, um, we get about $15 million in part-time faculty salaries. And I also included, so you, just so you would have it, because I know there was a question about it earlier, under the, there's another spreadsheet, the 1351 budgets. That's the, the calculation that we use and that we keep updated as the spring semester happens, the summer semester, so that we know where we are on track. The other piece of the salaries is classified in administrators, and basically those are prior year positions that are just budgeted forward. Um, what we do also is if there are dollars available, we, through the program reviews and unit reviews, we prioritize any classified or administrative posi positions that are um, requested and um, cost those out and see if there's dollars available um, once we get the base of the budget set, um, started. 
the next part of the salaries are your are your payroll taxes, and um, <laughs> this year the payroll taxes for as we've talked about the retirement for STRS and PERS have increased. Um, however, yesterday or Friday I was at a meeting and PERS was slated to go up to 12.6% uh, and now they're only going up to 11.8%. So that saved us about $200,000 for this next budget year. So that was good news. But overall, our, our mandatories have increased for faculty about 2.13% over the last five years and only 0.79% for um, over the last five years for, for classified. But over the, the total that we pay for them is 21% for certificated and 30% for classified. And that's because we pay both FICA and retirement for classified and faculty do not pay, um, pay FICA. We started getting a handle on the healthcare costs. We actually did a uh, floating cap in 2012-13. So the employer obligation doesn't rise to the same level of, um, as it would had we not done that. Then the rest of the budget is basically just the supplies and operating capital, um, which are just our operating expenses, our utilities, all of those types of things. And the final piece of the expenditures is um, our other outgo, which includes our debt service for OPEB. And when we get into, um, towards the end, when we get into the multi-year projections and start discussing those, you'll see that the OPEB debt service payment actually increases dramatically in the years 16, 17, and 17, 18. And we need to, we'll need to talk about that a little bit. So for this fiscal year, all of our revenues are coming in as we had anticipated. We're very close and on track there. Our expenditures are actually coming in a little bit less than what we had budgeted. Um, our end of year cutoff is April, it was April 10th for part, some parts of the budget and um, it'll be May 10th for other parts of the budget. So we're coming towards the end of our requisition stages. Um, we had, did have to increase our budget for the minimum wage increases for our students and um, some of our classified. And as I stated earlier, we're actually borrowing about 1,000 FTSs from the summer for this year in order to meet our target of 19,500. So for the big picture, when we originally, um, our working budget as it stands right now, um, shows that we have about 129 million in revenue, 127.8 million in expenditures, giving us an increase in our fund balance of about $1.1 million, which will bring our projected ending fund balance to a little over 16 million. Um, I'm estimating that the revenue with the increase in the FTESs it will bring in about $130 million and the expenditures about $127.4, which will give us an ending change, a change in ending fund balance of about $3.3 million. And I just wanted to put on here so that we, um, the actual formula for the ending fund balance, which is listed there, one of the, the things that um, the numbers that are included in that ending fund balance is actually any types of reserves. We collect some health fees for um, our, we collect health fees for some of our, um, well, we collect health fees from all of our students and those funds are actually um, reserved. And so we have to reserve anything that's not spent as um, part of our designated reserve. Our staff development dollars carry over also. And then we have um, the indirect costs that carry over. And then we also have our economic uncertainty, which in our case, we just, whatever our fund balance reserves are, that's what we consider our economic uncertainty. So then we have a, the, the trend of our fund balance, which as you can see, went from um, $11 million in 2010-11 and is projected to be about $18 million at the end of this fiscal year, 14-15. So for next year's budget, we're looking at um, one of the best budgets that community colleges have seen in quite a few years. It's a third year of ECOLA, even though it's under the 2%. Um, it's an increase to the district base allocation to the state. And that hasn't happened since the new SB 361 has been um, implemented. They're actually going to increase our base in order to help offset some of our PERS and STRS increased costs. There's some one-time allocations, which for our district is about over $5 million. 
that are actually from ongoing state coffers. And so although the state is saying that they're um, one time to us, they, could, they are ongoing sources for them. And then they also, on the increasing of the student success and student equity dollars, they're giving us those dollars without making us actually match them next year, which helps our general fund and other funds too. So right now where we are with our process for this year is we've sent out all the position spreadsheets and they're being reviewed at the colleges and all of the cost centers. Um, discretionary budgets are also out there being developed by the colleges and the, and the cost centers. And all that information is due back to us on or before April 24th, which at that time we'll compile it. We'll have a better picture of exactly where we're at. Um, it'll be reviewed at Cabinet and presented to PBC and then brought to you on the 9th of June as a tentative budget. And then from there, we'll go on to the 23rd of June for hopefully a, for approval. And then the next couple of slides just, or the next couple of information just shows the ongoing revenue for um, next year. And it's about $3.2 million with the one-time allocation of 5800 and that 5800000 that is the, um, the mandated class block grant that the governor is talking about. And we at the college have not, or at the district have not um, allocated those dollars out for next year, so you'll just see them dropping to the um, bottom line at this point. So that's just kind of an overview, but what we, what I wanted to do is I want to go over, um, I want us to have a discussion about the multi-year projections and where we are and where we're going to be. And I also wanted to discuss a little bit about the um, actuarial study that we received in the trust. Um, we had an actuarial study done on our OPEB liabilities and the actuarial study um, will be being brought to you, I believe, next at the next board meeting. But it's actually came in at about um, $152 million is what our, our actuarial for our OPEB liabilities is at this point, our, um, our liability. We have um, our portfolio, our trust portfolio is a little bit over $220 million at this time. So there's, um, we're having our retirement board meeting tomorrow and or excuse me, on Thursday, and we'll be discussing the, the irrevocable and revocable trust and getting all of that going so that we can use, so some of those dollars may be able to help us offset some of our future debt. Um, so with that, I just wanted to go over the, um, the multi-year projections. And the reason I'm saying that is because, as I stated earlier, our debt service payment in fiscal year 15-16 goes up to over $13 million, and um, that's about 10% of our general fund expenses. And so um, that is something that we'll be bringing back to you with some options of how we can actually look at that and help um, offset that in the future. So the current year, um, the current year, as I stated earlier, if you look under the estimated 2014-15 on the multi-year projections, You'll see that th that we are this year once again operating to where we will have a surplus, an estimated surplus in our um, fund balance of about $3.3 million. Next year in 15-16, and these numbers are very draft, but they will, uh, and they will change once we get all the information back from the colleges. Um, you'll see that it jumps to the 8.8 .8 million, and that is because that 5.8 million that um, the one-time dollars is not allocated is just dropping down to the bottom, um, as those are um, funds that we'll have to be discussing in cabinet and at, at all of the colleges. And then for 16-17, you'll see that um, we actually show that we would have a deficit in our fund balance of about three million dollars. And that is strictly because the debt service payment increases by over $5 million that year. And then the next year it goes up to almost $4 million because the debt service payment goes up by another million. Yes, yes. And so this also is t making the assumption that the debt service payment is a completely absorbed by the general fund completely. And so that's... Like I said, we'll have a discussion on actually where maybe the trust or other areas can help that out in the for the future years. So the um, the multi-year projections are 
I mean, they, they paint, I think we're in a good place. I think that, um, you know, we're, we have a positive fund balance. We have a healthy reserve. And we do have a plan that um, will be brought, or we're in the process of form, formulating a plan to help offset those increased debt service payments is in the future years. So, okay. And so with that, um, I know we wanted to have a discussion, but let's get that out there, and then we can go ahead and just start, I guess, the workshop portion and working on any questions or comments or, except for Nikki. Mm -mm. Oh, oh no. okay. Nikki's got a lot of questions. Yeah, Nikki's Nikki's mind's a, a turning over there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Test, test. Okay, go. here we go. go. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for your work, and I know your office is uh, often struggling with, with staffing issues, and so getting stuff together is, I'm sure, a challenge, and so I appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. Just paying the bills, I <laughs> appreciate that as well. Um, I, I literally have about 20 questions, but I don't want to dominate uh, the time and, and, it's okay. and like that. But um, I wanted to start by s understanding the uh, document that's titled History of Full-Time Equivalent Students. And just, okay. I'm trying to understand the document, first of all. Um, my understanding as I look at it is starting at 2007-8, we had, we were paid for 18,958.52 students, is that mm -hmm. FTS? Yes. Okay, and then we had uh, funded non-credit for another 455. So. What I don't understand on, and then like the next year, eight, nine, and the next three years, we had um, unfunded credit uh, anywhere from five to 3,000 students that we served, but we didn't get paid. Is that what that figure means? Yes. Okay, yes. so what I'm trying to understand is why in four of those years, we have no reported unfunded credit like, for example, last year, we had 18,601 funded. So that, I'm presuming that was our target and our, our enrollment target. That's what the state was going to pay us. Correct. And we hit that target. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. But what seems odd is that we hit that target exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, we didn't have any unfunded. I, that seems impossible to me, that we would have hit that exactly. Like, nobody ever does that. Uh, weren't there like 10, 100? unfunded that we like we overshot the target by 20 100 50 something like that what how do i understand those four years that we hit the target exactly or else we didn't hit the target and we didn't reach it and we we didn't hit our cap is that what well, that is well, the, the, the funded no. credit number there was not necessarily the target it was the actual that we so in those years where we had we uh, so 2007 12, 13, 14, did we not hit the target then? We exceeded the target. So then why didn't we have no, we didn't unfunded credit? Why didn't, like we got those four years uh, starting in uh, 2008 to 2011 where we're reporting that we had students that we serviced but we didn't get paid for them. Right. So what happened in those other four years there? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the the chart here. Those, in those in those other four years, um, I, I can speak for 12, 13, 13, 14, and 14, 15. In um, 12, 13, the, we our target was actually 300 more than the 18,099, but we were um, actually no, I stand corrected. Our target was lower than that, and we had some unfunded, but then the state had some extra funds that um, other districts did not claim, and therefore all of ours ended up being funded. Okay, so we overshot the target, and then the state came back and made us whole. Correct, in 12-13. Okay. Uh, and that explains those four years. The state came back and just gave us some extra money, and, and we got paid for exactly everybody we served. That's well, correct. in 12-13, but in 13-14, that was not the case. Last year, we actually borrowed, I believe, 152 
in order to make our target up to what the state would fund us. Okay, and then this year we're borrowing about a thousand. Correct, yes. Okay, it'd be helpful if the chart indicated when we didn't hit the target and then we borrowed. So that okay. leads to my next question, and just, you know, anytime anybody else wants to jump in, I don't want to monopolize this whole time, but it is worth You're still off. interesting, Nikki. Keep okay. going. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so over the last two years, we've, we haven't hit the target um, by, I don't know, looks like 1,150 combined, something like that, or maybe I'm double counting, but right. this year it was a big number. It was 1,000. Um, and we're going to borrow that from the summer, which is going to put us in the hole next year. We didn't hit a thousand, and so I'm trying to understand. Well, why didn't we hit that? Why did we miss it? And how do we think we're going to make up that and another thousand that we're going to be put in the hole from borrowing this year, next year? So when we go do our budgeting for next year, what gives us the confidence that we'll actually hit that target? So that's two questions. Why didn't we hit it? And what makes it? What's our plan to do it next year? Um, why we didn't hit it, um, I, I think that I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure as to why we didn't hit it. I don't know if someone wants to chime in or um, for this year. But as far as for next year's budgeting, um, we are shooting for a 19.5 and we do have our management enrollment and our um, enrollment strategies and we are working on that. The, the state, we, if we don't meet our 19.5 next year, we're guaranteed that funding for one more year. And so we would remain in stability for a year and then the, we would, the following year is where our 19.5 target, if we didn't meet it, is where we would lose the funded FTESs. So as far as budgeting, if we report that this year, we're guaranteed that money for 15.16. So 16, I, it, it's kind of hard to separate out the budgeting from the enrollment management. And mm -hmm. so if somebody can just address that question, what are we doing with enrollment management? What did we do wrong this year? How did we, we did what are we correcting wrong. for? Dr. Larkin, do you want to address that? There are several factors. I think a number of them are in terms of where the economy sat last year uh, with a number of students opting to either delay or not uh, re-enroll at some of our institutions. We have some anecdotal data on that as well. We had a lot of leadership changes uh, at a lot of the campuses. So I think it's a multivariant factor. We see that up and down the state. But we also notice that some states, some districts, like in Southern California, actually increase. So there, we're beginning to analyze what those patterns look like. But this is going to lead to a comprehensive enrollment management plan that we're now putting together. Uh, the chancellor's asked the presidents to put together their short and long-term strategies short term in terms of the summer and for the fall. And we hope to launch this August an Enrollment Management Institute, which will be an ongoing kind of operation that really begins to train us to think differently, how to position ourselves, how to leverage our resources better. One of the challenges we have, now that we've gotten new resources, triple SP, equity dollars, funds from the state, is how you marshal all those resources in a comprehensive way. So we're hoping to put together so we can meet those targets in this coming year and beyond. We've been looking at enrollment management as kind of an ad hoc exercise, and we're really looking at it now in terms of more of a continuous process. So that explains at least how we intend to get there and some of the factors in terms of why we ended up where we were. I have to also let you know that the campus has done some tremendous things to close that gap. Um, if you look at what we've done this spring, for example, all of the campuses were on the plus side. So it shows me some encouragement, stability of leadership, and a really constant, comprehensive thought in terms of how we move forward. That, that's a nice beginning. And I, you know, as moving forward, I think it'd be helpful for us as a board to understand the, the sort of the, what do those strategies look like. And this isn't a criticism. I mean, it's hard to hit your cap. And um, you know, at my home campus at De Anza, we, we've been in trouble in that district for years. We're just not hitting it. But what it's meant is that we're losing literally millions of dollars every year that we'll never get back. Or we, it'll take us years to dig back out of that hole. And so one year, 1,000 FTS, that's not huge, but it's not a good sign. And anyway, so I'm just asking the question. I've got others, but I don't want to hog all the time if my <laughs> colleagues have Does other questions. Does anybody else have any questions? 
I have one question. So what, I, what I'm understanding is that you see the impact of the borrowing coming and you're using the two years before there's actually a, say, uh, penalty or, or a consequence to do the enrollment management and to make the plan so that you could overtake the, the deficit in that time. Is, is that, am, am I articulating that correct? Yes and no. I, we're actually shooting and our targets are for the 19.5 for next year. Right. And so if we make the 19.5, we're, we're anticipating we will make the 19.5. And then we, we, it won't be a stability type of, um, but if we fall short, then we have that as a, a back, you know, we have a backup so that the state will fund us at that level. And then am I correct to understand or to presume that part of the, um, part of the problem or the challenges that we ha are experiencing have to go back to when the state began the, the mandatory cutbacks and we lost ground then and just the, the I impact of the recession and the state cutbacks which had a lingering effect on mm -hmm. tax revenues that um, are slower to um, recede when it comes to um, funding uh, that comes from the state. Yes, yes, and, and I mean, and, and you know, our, our, our enrollment grows as times get tougher and now that times are getting better, you know, and when they needed us, we weren't able to offer the classes that were needed. And now that we're able to offer the classes that needed, they don't need us as much. And so I think that that's part of the enrollment strategy to find out exactly who we need to reach out to and, and you know, bring those students back into us. And I, I think, and just one more question. Dr. Ravenberg, you had been planning, what was it, a, a, a enrollment summit? Was there was well, it has evolved from a summit, from a retreat to a summit to an institute, so that it's ongoing, uh, that will draw the expertise internally from, we have outstanding faculty and staff that know how to do some of these things, as well as outside resources as well. And Jeff Heyman will tell you that when the recession hit, we didn't have the resources to put out there in the field and do the recruitment that we normally have done. And when that happens, you lose all visibility. You lose your relationship that you've built for so long. And as a result, it takes a while to gather those back. And so that's what we're beginning to do is to restore all of those things, um, forge new partnerships, strengthen the ones that we have. And we really don't want to always just depend upon the marketplace. So we're looking at a strategy that's much more enduring, much more robust. Thank you. So it's not 19,500 we need next year. It's 20,005. Is that correct? Because we've got to dig out of the 1,000. Yes. OK. Yes. Coming back to the benefits question, um, you know, we did this floating cap in 2012, 2013, which, which limited the district's liability on health care, but it wasn't without a cost. That, that was a cost then that employees began to bear. What was that cost? How much did it cost them? Because when we think about uh, COLA, right. you know, we're trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we make employees whole and dig them out of the hole? But part of the hole is the health care. What, in fact, was that cost to employees between 2012 13 and now do we do we know um, well for the for Kaiser nothing Kaiser is free um, and then we have two. we offer two of the PPO plans the PPO light plan if you're a single employee and you're just claiming yourself it's $15 a month if you're fam uh, single plus one or employee plus one it's 30 if you're family it's 45 and then the um, PPO traditional, which is our Cadillac plan, that one actually is the difference between the PPO light premium and the PPO traditional premium. So basically we cover the PPO light um, premium and the Kaiser premium. It's just the, the other that we don't. And that ranges, um, and I'm, I, I don't want to give you a figure, because it's, but I think it's about, it ranges from like $140 a month to like four hundred or five hundred dollars a month for family, depending on what plan you take. I'm sorry, what? Oh, is it six hundred now? Okay. For family, correct? Okay, mm -hmm. so I, that's got to be a, a huge, and that's a monthly. Mm -hmm. All right, so multiply that out by twelve. Seven thousand two hundred. So that's a big that. Uh, Percentage-wise, okay, that's helpful to know. Mm -hmm. But looking forward on the Sturgeon Purr stuff, we know we've got these rate increases. We're going to get a little bit of money in the base this mm -hmm. year to help with that. 
But as we project out seven or eight years, it seemed to me that it was in the range of, I don't know, it was something like $14 million a year or something, a big number yes. that we were going to have to start paying uh, in addition to the employee side. I mean, they were going to pay a piece of it, but the, the huge part of it was going to be on the district. That's a huge chunk of change. What are, like, say the state doesn't come back and make us whole. Mm -hmm. those, what's our, what's our are, future projection? Are, when are the, we going to start hurting there? The, those costs are included in the medicals on here, um, and I'm looking for my spreadsheet because I don't have it off the top of my head. But um, the, the PERS rate was going up to 16%, I believe, and it's at 11. And, well, let me get the information real quick for you. But those are those costs are embedded in here. The other the other piece that we can that we can leverage to help offset that also is part of our um, OPEB trust. The as you know, we charge our um, ourselves basically for current employees' retirement, and so the current rate that we're charging for that is nine and a half percent of salary, and that. Um, once we determine the total amount that is going to go be in an irrevocable and a revocable trust, then our ARC will reduce by the amount of the irrevocable trust. And so we may be able to lower our employer portion for the uh, post-employment uh, benefit rate to help offset some of that PERS in the future also. So that's another option that we have. But I'm going to let me find that for you. I have it right here. That's a market dependent option though, right? I mean. Okay. Yes, well, and the, the OPEB is, yes, very market dependent, yes. So what would be helpful, uh, so I like that we're looking at, tw you know, all the way up to 2617, but I think a, like the five year picture would be helpful and then because we know that these PERS and STRS rates are gonna kick in over a seven year period, just really projecting that cost out would be helpful. I think the other thing that would be helpful is a big question mark around Prop 30 money, which is going to go away unless it somehow gets renewed, which would be important for us, and then the Measure B money, which will go away. Um, and so, you know, at a certain point, there's a huge cliff that we're going to fall off of unless we do the political things that we need to do to fill that hole. And I think that's just got to be part of our budget planning. Um, I'm not asking for it right now, it's not here, but I, it's, it's on my mind. The, just the very last question that I had it, it goes back to this one-time allocation money. So it strikes me that, um, you know, Herb Kitchen spoke earlier and, and he was talking about this achievement equity gap and he said, you know, this isn't just a PA issue and I think that's right. Um, because every student we retain is, is, is enrollment dollars, I mean, just raw, money calculation. So we've got this $5.8 million a block grant, a bunch of that's going to go in. Have we, could you talk, could the administration talk a little bit about how that money will be used, what your thinking is in terms of closing the equity gap and how that affects the, how that affects the <coughs> budget picture uh, in terms of enrollment management, if, if you could. And that was my last question. Well, we really haven't identify the use of those $5 million. Not yet, because we're not even sure we'll get them. Um, but, but in terms of the achievement gap, we have allocated parcel tax dollars for that. It's been slow to materialize, mainly because of our, um, I'll call it structural constraints with shared governance and getting people to buy into what we're trying to do. But the funding is there, and the, we just, as the board approved the uh, assignment of the, the district dean position for student success and student equity, uh, Lasana Hotep, who is uh, on board and beginning that work. And yes, it has been delayed, but it's not dead. We're moving forward with that. And then with the, going back to the five million, with where we, we haven't decided that's a shared governance item as well, but we're looking at 
um, some of our more glaring needs in scheduled maintenance, some of our facilities that need work. Uh, we're looking at our um, IT needs. As you heard in our report recently, the uh, people soft implementation continues to need more resources. So we're looking at those areas to um, plug in some of those gaps. So I, you know, my guess is that if we, if we retained an additional student in every classroom throughout the district, my guess is that for every student we retained in every classroom, we'd probably pull in an extra million dollars. Uh, in that neighborhood. I, oh, I you probably know that figure better than I do. And it occurs to me that one of the critical ways that we retain students is when we have student contact. And so I would suggest that part of our budget dollars be uh, go towards funding, uh, more fully funding uh, part-time office hours. You know, now some, of the, some of the part-timers will do this anyway. Um, but actually paying for the labor and making sure that the office hours are done I think is probably one of our best strategies in terms of uh, student retention and closing that gap. It's, I, I don't have the data in front of me to, to tell you that, and, and institutional research could probably demonstrate that. But I think <clears throat> to the extent that faculty members have that hands-on data and that we look in that area, I think we probably uh, could begin to improve success and, and also close that achievement gap. Thank you very much, uh, and I uh, appreciate your indulgence in giving me the time to explore these issues. Thank you also, um, right. Vice question. Chancellor Rennie. Oh, okay. I, I had one question. Weren't we, I, I believe we were going to have an update on the student success um, program. I, I know it's just beginning, but we were going to have a uh, presentation. Yeah, we're having a uh, status report on that. I, I believe it's scheduled for our next board meeting. Is that right? Dr. Orkin and I are working uh, to get that report ready. Okay, thank okay. you. And uh, Trustee Galassa? Um, yes, I just have a, a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the, uh, there was a slight decrease in the anticipated per STRS uh, uh, um, requirement, and it went from like 12 something to 11, blah, blah. Yes. Uh, is this, um, what is the cause of this? Is there recognition that the uh, annual increases projected are actually unsustainable, or is this just an accident? Um, no, they actually did an, um, their actuarial study at PERS, and they, they came in and they don't need the, the number, the percentage that they thought they were going to need. Their, their investments are doing better. Did they project out? for a couple no, of years? No, they only did this year. That was so the only this year. this is a happy note, right, this month. And uh, it's been re reported that um, they recognize that there's un some unsustainable elements in this whole uh, mess we're in and that um, there has to be, uh, let's just say, reason exercise when these uh, costs increase. The other question I had concerns you know, the drop in revenues. You said it's attributed to the increase in debt service. Could you just touch on that a little bit? Um, yes. What's the increase due, and then how does it project out for the immediate future? Um, the current structure that um, we're working with, as you may know, um, the second tranche, B2 tranche, yes. becomes due on August of 2015. And so the debt service payment, um, the current structure that we're using for these projections is that that, that first tranche will be paid off in five years. And so it's a $38.4 million um, liability. And over the next five years, the general fund would be pay making the payment for those bonds um, to the, to the bondholders. Um, and so that, though, it's, I believe it's, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. The first year is $7.5 million, and then it jumps up to over $13 million, and then $14 million, and $15 million, I think. So every year it increases a million after that. But that one year is the big million of the 5.5, I mean, the big jump of the $5.5 million. Um, and that's the structure. And then after that five years, then the B3 comes due. And so then you have the five years of the B3. And those are the structures that we're currently working with. Thank you. I, I, I realize that uh, we've been talking about this in uh, OPEB. I just wanted to make sure the rest knew what was uh, occurring there. Okay. <clears throat> you um, also, I think I saw an email recently about a projected $13,000 per year cost for our, our retirees beyond the Medicare. Is, the, is, is, 
is that just, it's, it's not an official looking document, and I just wondered, um, uh, Withrow and I discussed this earlier uh, today, uh, just what, what does that represent? Those are, um, and that's part of the actuarial study that'll be presented at the next board meeting, but it's the, um, the uh, Trustee Withrow was questioning the actuarial study breaks out the cost for post 65 and pre 65 um, payments and the post was it post or pre one of the I think it was the p the pre 60 post 65 was um, like 156 million dollars was our liability and he was asking for some clarification on that and we will be discussing that tomorrow okay, the, okay great thank you very much mm -hmm. and maybe my last point is on the achievement gap I thought it was a very eloquent presentation and it's something that uh, we talk about all the time, but at the same time, it's not necessarily right uh, before us as a visual objective. And, uh, and just a suggestion that uh, I would appreciate in the near, very near future <clears throat> a, um, a presentation on just on the nature of the gap, its comparison to other uh, districts, especially those with similar um, uh, demographics that we have here. And then a, uh, to, to hear from some faculty about the programs that they're instituting to ameliorate this uh, situation, uh, present successes, projected successes, and so on. Uh, I think this is uh, an extremely important um, <clears throat> a, uh, project, and uh, it would be helpful for all of us trustees to get behind it if we had a better concrete uh, awareness of all of the implications of that program. So thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that's, that's it for now. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor Rene. So the next, uh, that concludes our presentations, and the next item is the consent calendar. Do we have a motion to adopt the consent calendar? It's been moved by Trustee Handy and seconded by Trustee Riley. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. The next item we have is the action calendar. And we have the items there, 42, 43, and, uh, and uh, 32. So we'll begin, I suppose, with the first one that's listed, which is item 42. Well, oh, well we can begin in a numerical order with 32. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I uh, pulled 32 uh, only to add a few names. As you see, uh, we're in the midst of our election. Uh, the results will be given very shortly. Pardon? No, we're telling you. Okay, this is, uh, <clears throat> all right, here goes again. So um, what I'm asking here is to support a, a number of people for the, the board has the uh, privilege of voting for these uh, various members. There are five where uh, I believe the, we are eligible to vote for seven candidates here, and uh, five of them are incumbents. All of um, these people I've worked with very closely, and I uh, enthusiastically support them, so I hope the board will support that. The other, there are other four none incumbents, and we're entitled to vote for two of those if I understand it, and I'm making a recommendation after reviewing uh, the um, um, dossiers of the uh, candidates, and uh, I would um, suggest that uh, Janet Green be included among uh, those that our board votes for, and uh, the Richard Waters who uh, from Ohlone. Ohlone has been a very strong supporter of the organization. Um, and I give these as suggestions, uh, not as appeals, uh, and, but if you pr will vote for them, I appreciate it very greatly. Thank you. And that is a motion to add those two uh, to the incumbents for a total of seven. Um, okay. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded to accept the recommendation of Trustee Galassa regarding the CCT California Community College Trustee Board election. Yes, all those in favor? All in, <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. The next item on the consent calendar in numerical order is item number 42. Madam President, if we could deal with item 42 and 43 at the same time, it's, my, it's the same issue, and so if somebody moves the items, 
then we can have discussion. I'll make a motion to adopt items 42 and 43. Moved and seconded. Open for discussion. Thank you. Um, you know, I've read the background material on these, and I, I you know, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about the science project up there, and I just want to voice a concern. I don't even necessarily need general services to respond, but the concern is this, that we went out for bid, and on each of these items, we only got one bid. Now, one was uh, kitchen equipment and appliances for the nutrition department, and then the other was concrete paving, uh, parking stalls, et cetera. Um, one item was $130,000, um, and the other was almost a million dollars. And, you know, I don't necessarily want to hold this up or anything, but I think that if, in fact, on items like this, we're only getting one bid, then there's something wrong in our process. And I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe it's the way we pay vendors. Uh, maybe it's the way we advertise. Maybe these are just unusual circumstances and, and it's a one-off. But it was three items on this agenda where there was one bid plus a piggyback contract. And just when we do this, um, it just it kind of raises your eyebrows and you go, hmm, only one bid. Really? What's going on here? So the, I just wanted to make a comment, and I'm going to abstain on these items, but I don't mean to hold them up. Thank you. So we've got a uh, motion to adopt. Did, we had a motion, and it was open for discussion. So we'll call the question and call for a vote. All in favor of? Uh, I, oh, <laughs> did you have a comment, sir? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment before we go to the vote. Uh, I am not um, uh, as nice as Nikki. I, I would like just a brief explanation of why only one, I see uh, only one, uh, there was only one bid. I see that uh, you, in several instances, you had quite a uh, um, large attendance at the opening bids, Sarah, uh, and not opening bids, but at the pre, whatever you call that, when you gather all the vendors in and describe the project, um, and yet only one um, submitted a, uh, a proposal um, there, there's got to be some sort of explanation, and I'm sorry, my voice is um, disappearing here, but so is this just strictly a one-time uh, aberration, in this case, multiplied by three, uh, or? I, I'm sorry, I'll direct uh, the chancellor and ask the chancellor if we can have one of the st staff uh, respond to the question. Vice Chancellor Sadiq can do that. Thank you, uh, Trustee, for giving me the opportunity to tell you what is uh, going on in the marketplace. Uh, as you may be aware, about three years ago, uh, when there were a lot of uh, <coughs> contracts, a lot of uh, projects that the district wanted to do, we are coming to this board with about five, six, sometimes seven bidders on items. This is, was because of the uh, nature of the economy. And what is going on today is a different phenomenon. We have a lot of new construction that are going on all over East Bay, the San Francisco Bay Area. So there are more jobs in the marketplace for both small and large contractors to be done. So if a vendor comes to an event to be able to do uh, bid work to determine whether they're going to bid on an item. They go back to do calculate their profit margin on an item. If it does not meet what they intend to make, they may not participate in submitting final bid. Sometimes some of these bidders also don't have a bid bonds to be able to bid on various type of items all over the place. Because we are not the only game in town. You have OUSD, the Port of Oakland, Alameda County. So one of the ways that the purchasing department has done was to send these bids to a central repository organization called the Bay Area Builders uh, Exchange website, where all the vendors in the area can be able to see what is going on. And uh, they go into the website, they look at the specification. 
We know that they have looked at it because we have data to show that in the purchasing department. And, but yet, they don't bid on it. Then we, we send this to the local newspapers, ethnic local newspaper, like uh, Repertor, uh, Daily St. Town, and uh, the Post, the Oakland Post, which are the newspapers that ethnic uh, minority groups can be able to see uh, in the area so that they participate. Then we also draw up a list of vendors that has expressed interest in the past and send into purchasing. Then every year, here in the boardroom, we do an outreach program on how vendors can be able to bond together, to be able to get bid bonds, to be able to do, participate in our bidding process. So we will continue to do outreach because we go to various events uh, to be able to uh, have a pitch to let vendors know what projects are coming in the district. But we don't have control over how many vendors we actually bid on a particular program. But so these are efforts that the purchasing department has made on behalf of the district. Uh, thank you very much. I was um, just one last question on it. I appreciate the comments, and uh, also I think most of us uh, understand the the um, the virtue of a uh, joining piggyback uh, systems, et cetera, as a way to uh, diminish costs and um, and get reliable products. With the Leica. Uh, bid of 537,809. Since there are no other competitors, how do you determine that this is a reasonable uh, sum? Uh, you probably went out beforehand, inspect it to find out what, a, what the, in your estimation, the general costs would be, and if so, how does this measure up with your general uh, investigation of the potential cost? Yes, the architect for this pro project, JK, architect did uh, engineering cost estimate of what the cost is going to be if the project was to go out for bidding. Then we also send that same estimate to a cost estimator to quantify the job using <laughs> the plans and the material and labor that is going to be needed. And in each of these cases, the, the prices that we have here are within the guidelines. In other words, they are within the engineering cost estimate. And that is why we had the comfort level to be able to say, because this project is on the critical part, to complete it by June 30th, and the prices we got are within our budget and engineering cost estimate, that is why we recommended this to the chancellor. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. So we're uh, calling the question on the adoption of items 42 and 43. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? I believe there's one. Trustee gonzalez Hien. Motion carries. That is the, um, concludes our action calendar items and now announcements. Trustee gonzalez Hien, do we have any announcements? The next regular board meeting will be held on April 28 here at the district offices. Madam President, that includes the announcements for this evening. Thank you very much. The, the uh, special meeting of the uh, Board of, of uh, Trustees is concluded and the general meeting of the Board of Trustees is concluded.